Hello, Dion. This is Damage. This is an old school Psytrance that has been making a lot of music for a lot of years. This guy is from South Africa, but mostly live in Japan for years and mostly playing in Japan. And hope today we have a lot to learn from the project, from Dion himself, from music and a lot of stuff. I thank you for accepting this. I've been a fan for a lot of years. I found you out in 2008, maybe. And since then, I've been following around all the releases and all the music. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to be here, man. Nice to finally meet you as well, Marcus. <laughs> you know, uh, I first listened to your songs on maybe the Damage versus Zeta song. The, mm -hmm. Ah, I don't, I don't not remember the song, but it was the first one I've listened from the Burning album, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, when was the first time you contacted me? I lived in Tokyo, I think it was 2008. Uh, no, I think it's a bit further. Maybe bit some further? years, some years later, like 2012 or something. All right, okay. 2013, something like this. All right. Well, uh, so to start up with some some questions and some stuff, some talking. I would like to know how has been the the whole situation about the last year that word has been through for you and, and Japan. Yeah, the COVID nightmare. Actually, Japan has been very cool with the COVID situation. Um, there's no serious lockdowns. Uh, everyone is wearing masks. Everyone can still go to work and earn a living. Um, Maybe the restaurants and the bars have suffered a little, but other than that, everything is okay. From the this day we're speaking, from February, uh, does do you still have events there? Does everything's working normal, like bars, restaurants, and events? The restaurants um, has sized down, but they're still open. Uh, bars and events, there are some, but it's very few. And of course, everyone is wearing a mask. Is it possible for you to play or not DJ? I had to cancel gigs, um, oh. but there has been some events. I have seen some. Mm. Well, it's not, not good to have to cancel gigs. Yeah, it sucked. I mean, I had to cancel, I think, two weeks before the gig. Oh. So. <laughs> You mostly play on Japan, or you used to go outside Japan? I used to go outside Japan, but since I'm doing other work here in Japan as well, it's becoming very difficult to leave Japan. You know, if I leave Japan, it's basically I have like three or four days, and, you know, that's that's not enough. So mostly I play inside Japan. Yeah. Can, can you tell me, uh, I'm curious myself, uh, how all this start and how you ended up moving from South Africa to Japan and your music career? Well, I started in high school with the dream of becoming a rapper. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I did a lot of like hip hop dancing, you know, like break dancing and stuff. And then towards the end of high school, I decided I want to be a DJ. So I started training in like hip hop clubs on like vinyl with hip hop DJs. And that went on for a year or so. And, you know, someone introduced me to like the European um, rave scene, like the music from there, like the old school house music. And I became very interested in that. And like, you know, like Thunderdome and Terrordrome, like all these old uh, hardcore gabber uh, CDs. So I became very interested in that and started buying like really like old music production software like Rebirth from I think it was Propellerhead. And I started messing around with that. So I traveled to Europe and I got my first synthesizer which was a Roland JP8000. And returning back to South Africa, I started um, just jamming on that and I think I used uh, Fruity Loops back then. And I also started going to Psytrance parties. So I started, you know, developing the love for that music and tried to produce Psytrance, but I was really not that good at it. 
and but it, it became better, you know. And eventually, I met James Copeland. Um, he was actually in high school with me, and he's broken toy. So we started making music together, and that's when we started with the Damage Project. And of course, from there, the rest is history. So you actually started Damage by living in South Africa still. You were still there. Well, I just went on holiday in Europe and, you know, I bought a synthesizer there. And when I came back, that's when I really got into music production and, you know, trying to understand what goes into making Psytrans. So when exactly did you move to Japan? When did I move to Japan? I think it was 2004. Yeah. Oh, this is a lot of years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You... You moved to Japan and you kept going with Damage by releasing songs and all this stuff. But uh, what exactly made you move to Japan? Was it an opportunity, someone whom you contact there? Um, well, we did the first tour to Japan and that time I was still together with James. We did the duo as Damage. And I made a lot of connection in Japan at that time. And uh, I met my wife on the first trip to Japan. And I had another second trip to Japan and we became a bit more serious. And then when I returned back to South Africa, that's when we started, we decided um, to split me and James. And he went solo with uh, Broken Toy and I went solo with Damage. And then, of course, the third time when I got back to Japan, you know, I married my wife and started a life in Japan. Oh, so so Damage started as a duo project and then you be, it became just your project, your solo project. Right, right. When I first listened it, it was really more like a Psytrance. Uh, nowadays, I can say it's an old school Psytrance, but <laughs> in that time I found it out it wasn't. Like a full on, it was like a full on stuff. I uh, don't know much about the, the specifics of the gen, but uh, it had these elements of rock and roll sometimes. I love this kind of stuff. But then right. again, uh, some years through, the, I, the other album I listened years, years later was like more. Uh, thriller elements in there, it's like a terror stuff and a terror theme. Uh, how, how how about this stuff? Where, where these ideas came from? Well, okay. First, I mean, as far as game genre and movie genre, I love like dark sci-fi and like horror movie. And you know, I also listen to a lot of like thrash metal and death metal and hardcore. And so it's just something that feels natural to me. So it's not intentional when I make music that it sounds like that. It's just what comes out because I guess, I guess I'm influenced by those things. Well, I, I remember one song of yours that you got the Enter Sandman riff from that, or the guitar part. Mm -hmm. Get, getting raw, yeah. isn't it? Getting raw. Yeah, 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 getting raw. Yeah, that guitar was actually played by James. Oh. <laughs> Right, right. I, I'll never guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was funny because I tried to sample, I tried to sample the album from, you know, Enter Sandman. So I tried to sample the track and it just didn't sound good, you know, because it had like the drums and stuff on it. So I remember going over to James's house and I told him like, fuck man, I'm trying to sample this, but it just sounds terrible. So he picks up a guitar. <laughs> And it's just like, well, just record this. And he just starts like fucking playing it, you know, like just one take, like perfectly. I was like, I damn, dude. <laughs> so he knew the song. He, he knew the song. He was just yeah, he knew it really it. well. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, great. Yeah, be because it would be actually very, very hard to sample just the guitar if you wanted and remove the drums because exactly. even if you use the equalizer and all the stuff, you would still be there some of the vocals or some of the stuff. Right, Never right. get the clean guitar there. Right, right. <laughs> well, uh, there is one thing I wish to mention that is all related to Japan. Obviously, mm -hmm. I, I wish to know more. 
you in Japan, you met this guy. One guy that I, I never had the opportunity to meet him. I would obviously like to meet him, uh, talk to him once. It's the Zeta, Zeta Rocks. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did you meet? How did you meet him? And how did you make up an album with him? You make like one album and then one track in another album, something like this. Mm. So Zeta's name is Takeome, and when I first went to when I started living in Tokyo, so every week like a friday evening we met up at this friend's uh, studio and it was usually this guy daniel and another friend um, paul he's nrs also a side trans producer and they had a friend who was takiomi and he would come over sometimes and i can't remember exactly how we decided to do the album but I think, I guess I just asked him like, hey, let's do something. And he had a connection with Marty from Megadeth. This was right. what I get into. This is exactly right, right. what I wanted to get into. Right. <laughs> so when I heard that, I was like, oh shit, we have to do this. <laughs> you know, we got to do this album. <laughs> so yeah, we did this album and Marty like, you know, he did the guitars for us. So that, so was, you, that was really you cool. Actually. You, you actually met Marty Friedman. I didn't meet him. Oh. I did. <laughs> but I got him on my album. But I, I would love to, to have something about how he was in recording. You know, I would just throw him out. Oh, I want the guitar like this. And he would just go like, okay. And all this fancy stuff and very fast. <laughs> right. So he was I awesome think... in the album. So Takeomi has a studio, and I think in the studio he records a lot of rock bands and maybe does some post-production as well for TV shows. And Marty is living in Japan, you know, and I think maybe they have some connection there. Yeah, because the, the guitars on that album you had to do together were really, really interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's another level mm -hmm. of a guitar when you just have like a... Imagine me, some someone like very amateur trying to do a bass in a side trance song. Okay, it might sound cool, but it would never be like uh, much of rhythm in recording real guitars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's very difficult to do guitar on a on a techno beat, kind of. Uh, you have to be extremely tight. It's not like in. I mean, you have to be tight anyway in a rock band, but especially on like the electronic beat you have to be super tight one thing i i got from people that teach me stuff and this on is that on site and stuff not only you have to be on the grid in, in case i'm talking about ableton the grids in ableton you have yeah. to produce have to be all this stuff in the grid mm -hmm. but you actually have to play with a metronome really really tight stuff into the beat because or else uh, otherwise, everything would be out of place and out of stuff. So I recent, I'm working on an EP now, and I'm almost done with it. It's called Old School, New School. And one of the tracks on there, I wanted a friend of mine to do some guitar. And I've seen so many videos of him, and he's playing really good guitar. I mean, he's been doing it for very long. And he sent me recordings, and it just didn't work. You know, it's, it's like a really good guitar playing, but it's not tight enough. You know, it just it didn't sound good. So I ended up not using it. Oh, damn. And so I think in it's better for him to actually be with me in the studio and we can do a couple of takes. You know, that's what it's going to take. But just to do it over the Internet, he's sending me a recording. Yeah, it's not it's not good. I'll tell you that today I got the exact same experience. I went on to the friend studio today to do some stuff and I went there with the project on the pen drive with a lot of bass recording. I made like a lot of different stuff to an intro I had in mind. Mm -hmm. But simply I got all this stuff in no BPM at all because I, the intro I got is from something else that I don't know the BPM. Then I just started picking the notes and let's go, let's do it. But in the end, it was, he was like to me, this is not going to work. 
then we make the beats and all the stuff and he was like now you have the tempo now you can do it record back again at home and now i have to do it with the full stuff done well this this whole change you make to, to the song as well you over the years uh i i see that you, your song has your sound in general i don't know the last album how it will be but i see that in the past 10 years it has become a more faster sound and yeah. more i can say more with more strength on it i believe strength it's somewhere that fits in uh, why the changing at all all right so I actually, I tried to go slower for a while, you know, like 140 BPM. And recently I also tried a 138 BPM, but it doesn't work with my sound. It just doesn't work. It just sounds like trash. So the track I did that was 138, I'm not even releasing that. I just think it's shit. <laughs> so for, my, for, for the vibe of my music, I have to go faster. I have to go... I have to keep it 145 minimum and then go up from there. The BPM I usually most like is on 45. Right. So one of the tracks on the new EP I did is actually 155, which is the fastest side I've done so far. Um, I don't know why. I just decided I'm going to go with that tempo and let's see what happens. And it worked. So... I think mainly I'm influenced by the places I'm playing in Japan. You know, you go to the party maybe in Osaka city and the party starts like really hard, really fast. And it just keeps the straight line <laughs> to the end of the party. You know, it's just maximum power. And I'm definitely, I'm, I'm influenced by that in my music. In these latest years, Japan being on this hype of fast music and fast side trend stuff, they are liking this stuff. They like, like maybe 148 around there, you know, but they don't like like the super fast stuff, you know, like 180, not really. Those are very small parties. Oh, in Brazil, there was a time like um, 2014 or something like that, that people really, people in here were like uh, really slow. The, the 138 to the 140s, something less. People were into this stuff. The offbeat stuff were right, really right. a thing here. But uh, I see that nowadays, well, obviously, <laughs> before pandemic, when I was there to see it, well, diversity is a thing here. It, it, mm. it, it's really hard to have this, uh, I mean, not very common to have a party full of just fast stuff. Uh, usually when you have that, if it's a big event, you have one stage for this stuff and one another main stage. But right. yeah, you have this event for fast parties, okay? Fast tracks, fast music. But if I can say that in general, to summarize the whole scene, diversity is a thing here. Like you start from old school stuff and then you go on and then you have even more old school stuff like Goa, like uh, uh, mm. 90s side trends and so on. But then you have fast stuff offbeat stuff i believe mm. brazil is absorbing all the culture from outside but a big influence in brazil is israel israel music always been a big influence here yeah if you go to tokyo in japan it's more similar to brazil style you know, the music is more relaxed they're more slower tempo um, they like more the israeli sound so in japan it differs from state to state um so far, you know, I've seen Tokyo and then I've seen the rest of the Japan, which is all the same. <laughs> so the rest of the Japan faster, harder, Tokyo more relaxed. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, I believe in Brazil it's all the same. And mostly we have like, uh, well, I don't know how it is in Japan. It could be interesting to know. But in Brazil, we have like this uh, big agencies or somewhat big agents. And they have their castings. They are mixed castings. And let's say uh, a guy comes in from outside into tour. He will be touring the whole weekend in all the parties around Brazil. It's uh, lots of parties in the same weeks in Brazil and other states. So they all kind of share the same lineup. So they all kind of share the same flow, the same genre, same stuff. Because mm -hmm. logistic is the thing. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, how, how it is in Japan about all these agencies and stuff and people coming in, parties at the weekends for states? 
When I lived in Tokyo, I had an agency, um, but you know, I haven't been dealing with agencies after I left Tokyo. So I really can't answer that question. You kind of book yourself then, like a right. events book it yourself. Yeah, I mean, I've been here for a while now, you know, and I've made friends with a lot of the organizers. So I have personal relationship with them for many years. So I think to have an agent between us is it's not a good idea. Would you consider the opportunity if it comes to have uh, an agency representing you outside, like in Brazil, for example? Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. You know, of course. Well, I believe it would be really, really possible. Uh, even when you say you to travel, it would be like three or four days off only because you have to go back. But this is. This is exactly what happens to people that are in Brazilian agents. They just come in for this couple of days, they play, and then they go back to their countries. So right, right. It would be the same logistics. There is a Japanese guy that, is, that has an agency, someone, an agency with him here in Brazil, like uh, Spectra Sonics, I believe. Mm -hmm. He was to play in Rio, my state here, uh, if it wasn't by the pandemic last mm -hmm. year. Now, uh, if you don't mind, I always get into this stuff, this tech stuff about audio and all deep diving into music, producing stuff. Wait. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I like this stuff. I don't know much. It's always an opportunity to learn new stuff. But yeah. uh, how can you tell at first uh, about your process of music making? How does the flow works? So there's, there's two things that's happening. So the one thing is I will maybe learn a chord progression, maybe a famous one, or maybe something from a pop song or whatever, you know, from a metal track. And I will learn how to play that chord melody really, really well on my keyboard. And then I'll start, start to improvise, you know, and start to make all kinds of melodies that work with that chord progression. And I'll learn to play it really well. And then I'll open a door. I have, a, I have one project that I record all that MIDI into. And I'll just play it in, record it into Cubase and save the file and keep it for maybe some future track. Then if I actually want to start making the music, I'll maybe open that project, listen through the melodies, um, decide which one I use, uh, check the, the root key, and then start a project. I usually start kick, bass, and drums, and I'll start making the leads and everything. And I don't, I don't start from beginning to end. I usually do sections of the track. Just, just be completely free. And then once I've got like a couple of minutes, I'll start to edit, you know, like rearranging everything to make like the story of the track. Once, once I've got the story done, then I'll start like with all the automations, you know, the cosmetics of the track, the mixing, you know, all the nerdy stuff. <laughs> well, to clarify the, the automation, it's like, uh, well, let's give an example. You correct me if I'm wrong. If you mm -hmm. want the volume of some track, some channel, you got this channel of a keyboard. If you want the volume to change in just some parts, then you can do what's called an automation. You pick up the volume just right into the spot you want, and then you have it more or less. And this is yeah, an automation that can be used yeah. for anything you want. Right, right. So not only the volume, I use it for the effects, you know, like EQ sweeps, like, you know, send effects, everything. Just, just making a lot of movement in the track, you know, to make it alive. Yes, yeah, so just, well, just to make, uh, oh, maybe some people watching this don't know, don't even know what's music producing, no? Right, so right, what is right. automation? It's, it's a very touch right. stuff, but I, I really want people to get interested into this stuff because they are really cool. Even if you're not doing it professional, to have fun, they're, they're, they're mm -hmm. fun to do. Music is fun. There's any if there's a young producer out there who's making music and he doesn't understand why his music doesn't feel alive, that's the key thing, the automations. You know, that's what gives life to your track. 
Yeah, one, one thing that for me uh, makes a huge impact and a huge difference is when you, you, you get the track ready, you listen to it, you, you, you like it, but if you listen to it when it's mastered, but the master track is something else, mm -hmm. if you have the master and then you open this, the project you were doing without the master, it feels like a dead track. Uh, the better you get, uh, the less you will see that effect. Like, like now, my, when my track is done, it doesn't sound very different from the master track because everything is already, I know what the master is, has to be. So everything is already set to those levels. Oh, so you, when you are mixing, you are finishing the track, you're actually thinking on the master and using all the skills you have that obviously I don't have. <laughs> Right, like the less you have to do in the mastering, the better, you know, you want the track to be as close as possible to the finished product before mastering. Mm. Like if, so, if you have to open a track in mastering and do like crazy stuff, you know, then there's something wrong with the mix of your track. You do your own masters, you do like the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. For this stuff like mixing and mastering, do you use like analog compressor and stuff or do you use full digital? I use a hybrid system. So some plugins, some hybrid, um, like analog gear, outboard gear. Do you think for synths, for example, it's more interesting to use just plugins or it's still worth it to buy these synths like you told before the one you got from on Europe? I have mixed feelings about that. If you think about synths as um, a sound designing tool, then plugins would be your best option. If you think uh, of a synthesizer as an instrument that you learn how to play, like a guitar, then hardware, you know, because then it's going to be all about performance. Usually, when I do, when I record my hardware, synthesizer i'll do many jams of the same part and i'll learn how to jam it like really well and that's something you cannot do with software so when i record from a hardware synthesizer there's usually some soul inside that recording you actually play it yeah 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 i mean i love it it's an instrument you know <laughs> yeah i i get the feeling i like this too you mm. you can do this, uh, you know. You can bind this keys to do automations while playing and this stuff. And this, this is a very tricky stuff. Like when you have this MIDI stuff to control stuff, and you put in the knob to like uh, to do a filter or something. Well, mm -hmm. you could do it with the mouse there while the track is playing when automation, but it will not be the same as actually playing and you know spinning yeah. the knob. Yeah, you should really avoid doing automations with the mouse. Like, try to have a controller that is connected to the to the soft synth or whatever, and just you know, record that automation live. Yeah, this is far more interesting. Yeah, if you make a mistake, you know, then you can go into the automation and maybe make some correction with your mouse. But the more you do it, the less mistakes you'll be making. You know, you get better at it. I wanna. When I play stuff like in the MIDI controller, you play the notes, I usually get the tempo wrong because mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a very good uh, to keyboard player or stuff. But then again, I go into the mouse stuff and just put in, correct the mistakes, you know. You also have to check your latency on your audio interface. You know, it has to be as short as possible. If yeah, you do. for right. hearing, right? Right. Well, the, there's something on this, still on this topic. As a personal habit of mine, when you're doing an EP, like if, let's say you're gonna put in there five tracks, right? You're gonna put five tracks on this EP, and then you stop the first one. Do do you do you usually take like the same kick and bass, the same transitions? Do you like them to have the same uh, vibe or the same feeling, or you just go and that is this? Never, never. I never use the same kicks and basses. That's why it takes me forever to make a track. <laughs> like, I don't know, it's something, like I listen to a lot of hardcore as well. And one thing you notice about hardcore is every single track has a different kick drum. 
even the same artist will never use the same kick drum. And I like this idea. So every single track I do is a different kick drum. It's a different bass. Yeah, but I, I get now why it takes long to make a track in your case, because you know, the, if you have the kick and bass ready, it's like a shortcut. But making them again, from, you make them from zero in every track, or at least you import them and try some changes. I, I have three methods. So one method is sampling from other CDs or something. And then I will blend them together like three kicks. I'll use like different parts of each kick. Oh. <laughs> and <laughs> the other, other method is just to buy a sample, sample CD, you know, or well, not sample CD, just download a sample. But I'll do some tweaks on it still. And the third method is to actually do it with synthesis. Like uh, you pick a silent serum and all that stuff. Right, and, right, right. Know, in from zero. Mm. Uh, th this is the most difficult one, I believe, right? It's the most difficult one, but it's the one that has the best results. Uh, I kind of agree. Yeah. Because yeah. I think it's because this one, it's the one you can mostly customize and make it sound the really way you want it to sound. Right. Exactly. Do you produce other stuff outside of electronic music nowadays, or have you ever done out, out other stuff? I have a side project called Evil at Heart. And in that project, I'll do like electro house or darkroom techno or something like this. Mm. But it's still very young. You know, I've only have, I have a couple of releases on that. And for your releases, uh, uh, mostly for Damage, it, it's your own label, right? The label yeah. is yours. Yeah. D does it release other artists or just for you? No, no, no. I release quite a few artists. Um, the label is called Dismaster Records. Um, we focus on all genre of dance music, but something with more power to it, you know, more full on vibe. So it doesn't matter which genre in dance music, as long as it's as long as it has some serious balls to it, you know, we'll release it. What's the criteria for releasing a song from another artist, for example? You just have to like the song? Yeah, if I listen to it the first time, it has to, you know, it has to really grab my attention. You know, I usually, I mean, I listen for a good mix down. I listen for passion, if I can, I mean, I know when there's passion that went into music. So that's the main thing for me, like good mix down and passion. If I hear those two things, then yeah, I'll give a contract to an artist. Since you have your own label and work with another artist and stuff, can you explain me how, how it works when you have uh, elements from outside, like you get samples and stuff that may be subjected to copyright stuff? How, how does this work, the, the whole process of copyright in this case it's tricky and it's becoming more tricky you know with algorithm algorithms picking up on it on youtube and stuff like this so if i hear a track which is clearly sampled from some famous music you know i, I cannot release it i've had a couple of times where i told the artist like you know we have to change it it has to be removed so these parts like if you have a a speech from a movie, a famous movie, then you'd have to change it. Or you can get away with it. Yeah, you can get away with it. Just as long as you do some processing with it, you know, and as long as it's short, you know, it can't be through the whole track. And also, you know, if it's like a cappella from old hip hop tracks or something, as long as it's not new, as long as it's, you know, like 20 years old or something, there's really no problem, I think. In the don't end. don't quote me on this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. The, the disclaimer: I'm not giving anybody permission to do this. <laughs> yeah, people will listen to this and we start picking him and then to pack songs and no, oh, it's okay to do now. No copyright on this stuff. <laughs> no. Yeah, but but really, I, I'm asking this because. Uh, some stuff I started to make actually came in from uh, one simple thing that I got in there. Well, and I started, oh, is this a problem with it? I'm going to play the bass along, but you know, this is still this. How much I can use, how much I have to change and all this stuff that I, I, I really don't know. What, what's the, this thing line, where I can go, where I cannot go, you know, because mm -hmm. you risk 
imagine someone is willing to take the risk with me in releasing something that may be subjected to copyright, and then boom, you got the all the label copywriting your stuff and right. the whole process. It, it, it depends who you're sampling as well. You know, if it's someone like, let's say, the Beefy Boys, you're all good. I mean, they've officially claimed that it's okay to sample them um, because they started with sampling other bands. Um, just, I guess, take care of who you sample before you sample it. But you is, know? It possible, is it possible, for example, uh, if you wish to play like a Black Sabbath riff in there? It's a very famous band, and maybe what you are using is very famous as well. Is it possible to actually have this contact label to label to get an authorization to have this on track? It depends how big you are. If you're not very big and you contact them, you're not going to get any response. <laughs> so, so in that case, I would say don't do it. Okay, okay. Well, it, it, if, 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 if your music is going to become very famous and you're going to make a lot of money, then you are in serious danger if you don't have permission. I see. So, well, it's always a thought. I, I, I say that because, uh, well, if you like me, an ex uh, instrumentalist, you can play some stuff, maybe for starters, they would go on and try to play some stuff. But I see some people starting music, uh, producing music all, all around. And mostly when they start, they start up with bootleg remix or sampling stuff. So this is actually a fair topic because, you know, yeah. these people have to give a thought into the future. The right. music being right. played, music online. Um, yeah, bootlegging is something I've never been a part of, you know. Uh, it's just I put so much effort into my music. I want it to be released and I want it to generate some revenue. So, you know, if you bootleg something, you can't release it. You can play it maybe in your live set. I mean, it's good for that. But I can also play my own original original music in my live set. So I never saw the purpose of doing a bootleg. I mean, you're basically riding on the fame of another famous artist. So that that's my personal opinion. I mean, it's worked for some people and good for them. But personally, I wouldn't I wouldn't take that route. Well, uh, uh... I kind of agree with your vision, especially because you, as you said, you put so much effort in your own music and why why not release it, you know? You, why not make it with so much effort to be releasable, to be mm -hmm. something, something we can release? I've heard of I've heard of artists, you know, they'll do like a, maybe a bootleg or something and they'll put it on their EP, but they won't, they won't sell it. It's like a bonus track. And if you want this bonus track, you have to buy the full EP. You know, so they don't get money for that track specifically. So I don't know how legal that is. You know, it's a very gray, gray area. I don't know either. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't do it. Is is Beatport is still a thing up there in Japan for you? Like selling tracks from Beatport is still up there? Beatport is still the main revenue gener generator for us. So, you know, second place is Spotify, third place is Apple Music. Does YouTube is interesting as well? Because YouTube now has this identifying tracks you can post also there. Because uh, you mentioned Spotify. Well, I think Spotify is a nice platform to listen to, but I see a lot of artists complain about the revenue on Spotify. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not a great situation, but, you know, I mean, what are you going to do? You're fighting against giants. But but does YouTube uh, offer something better than Spotify or just the same? I think maybe the same. But still, oh. I think Spotify is better than YouTube. But I'm not complaining about Spotify because I also have a Spotify account and I love it. You know, I love being able to listen to whatever music I want to. Uh, so. This is the most interesting part where you just don't have these gigabytes in some stuff or a lot of exactly. these CDs. Exactly, you know. Well, it's interesting, but uh, and also one thing that I like it's kind of the recommendation stuff. You listen to some stuff, then you travel into something far different, and maybe you, you discover something new that you exactly. kind of like it. Right, right. I mean, I've discovered so many artists and new bands that 
I never knew about. And also being able to go back in history to like the 70s and find albums from that time, which I never knew about, you know, and I absolutely love. Uh, uh, how come did, do, do you created your label? Why, why did, when was that and why? I think in 2014, so before 2014, I released with a label, a Mexican label called uh, Terror Lab Industries. And I released with them for quite a few years. And the CEO at the time, he wanted to close the label. But I really liked the label. So I told him, you know, let me take over the label. And he became like a shareholder of the label. Um, but the label was only Psytrance. And I really wanted to do a label that is all genre. So in 2018, You know, I just decided, okay, I'm going to start another label, which became the main label and uh, the previous label became like a sub-label. Oh, I see. So you have two labels today. Right. Well, um, I would like you to tell me, how do you see the future? What's the plans? And how do you see the the, the next year without COVID, the, if the party is going to come back with more fears than before? I think so. I think it's going to become it's going to come back with a lot of energy. Like if I just think about the EP I just did, this EP is so aggressive sounding. <laughs> just from being stuck in my house every day, you know, not being able to go out to clubs and I have so much energy and frustration inside of me and which is probably why I went to the 155 BPM track. So If I'm doing this, I'm sure other artists will also be, you know, putting more energy into their music, maybe a more frustration into the music. And I'm really looking forward to when the parties come back. I think it's going to be a blast. I really want to listen to this new album stuff. This nice yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff. <laughs> I'll send you links, man. Yeah, I'll put them all in the description when this video is released. Great, great. Yeah, and well, I would love... I I'd love the talk with you. It was very interesting. I'd like, uh, if you wish to add something, do you, do you want to add something to this? Yeah, man, just a message to everyone out there suffering from this COVID situation. Just just hang in there, man. Like it's, al it's almost over, you know? The vaccines are coming out. Hopefully life will become normal again soon. Just push through it, you know? Stay strong. I hope so. I thank you a lot for accepting this, especially because I'm a fan of your work. Long, long time, more than 10 years now. Well, and I, I hope you'll keep doing it and you can count on me for all the support you want. And I obviously, the would be very, very interesting if you one day could come to play in Brazil. I, I hope the audience like this. I guess they will like this because, you know, there is lots of space for every kind of music here. Not because Brazil is a huge country, but as I said, diversity is a thing here. So people like all kinds of stuff you can ever imagine. Yeah, it's been, it's been a long time since I've been there. It's, I think more than 10 years ago. Oh, so you played in Brazil before. I, I thought yeah, you never yeah, came yeah. to Brazil. Yeah, yeah, I played there. I did one tour there. Do you remember the party or? or the I think I did. Four, four or five parties. I can't remember exactly where. I just remember it was extremely difficult for me to adjust to Brazil. <laughs> Time zones like, and stuff? Like the, the first party I played, I just played the same way I play in Japan when I'm used to it. Just like start really hard and fast and just keep it going. And there were some complaints from people after the party. Like, wow, this guy was really playing too fast, like too hard for too long. So I adjust my style for the next party and I just mellow it down. And then after that party, I heard from people, yeah, his music was too mellow. He had to go more faster. And I was like, man, shit, <laughs> what am I supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what an experience <laughs> oh, yeah but but i i hope you'll come back and i hope the experience is far better than nowadays 
Look, I loved it. I really loved your country. I mean, it was great. Yeah. Really, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for all of this. I'll keep in touch. <laughs> Oh, my God.